muchísimas gracias por estar aquí para profundizar en la compasión, en algunos elementos del budismo, en su contacto con Occidente. Pero antes de todo, si no le importa, nos gustaría sentir la presencia de su santidad, el Dalai Lama, a partir de su experiencia de 30 años como traductor, contándonos dos anécdotas, eh, una que le haya impactado a nivel humano y otra divertida, porque sabemos que es proverbial su sentido del humor. Um, I have had the honor to um, translate for His Holiness for over 30 years, as you said. Um, you know, I initially began in my 20s as a young man. Uh, I was a monk, and um, um, I just happened to have uh, some ability with English because many of the monks who are trained in monastics uh, we don't have facility with English. But I just happened to be one of those. Um, now, of course, f as a Tibetan, for us. The Dalai Lama is more than a human being. He is not just another person. He is the manifestation of the Buddha of compassion. Uh, so there's a long, you know, institution mythology surrounding who he is. Um, but on the other hand, once I start working for him uh, as his interpreter, which involves a lot of interaction, then then it's like he's my boss. You know, <laughs> I'm I'm working for him. So. That long period of <coughs> working for him really gave me a lot of an opportunity to see the human side of the Dalai Lama. Um, and most of people who have actually seen him or met him or seen him on television, will one thing that will come to your mind first is that he he's a happy person. Yes. And there is a kind of a real joy. Yeah. Um, of course, he's a very serene person, but also he's quite a serious person. And uh, one of the things that inspired me about the Dalai Lama right from the beginning is that the moment he wakes up in the morning, he thinks about the world. He thinks about making a difference. He thinks about creating a better world. And I've never really seen anyone who lives so much for the world. Um, of course, he's a Buddhist. He's a Buddhist leader. He has to think about He's the leader of the Tibetan people. He has to think about his own people. But if, in terms of time he spends, much of his time is really spent on thinking about the world. Um, in terms of uh, um, you know, things that impact me, of course, there are many stories. Uh, one of the things that really kind of uh, impacted me was uh, after I decided to become a lay person, start a family, um, I left the monastic order. Mm -hmm. uh, I was worried uh, because he's a monk, I was a monk. and. Um, so, and I did not ask his permission, um, I can't, because he, of course, as a monk, will say, you know, you should, you should try harder. But after I stopped being a monk and had the first chance to, you know, meet him, uh, I was worried. Um, so I turned up <coughs> and then I apologized. I said, I'm so sorry to turn up in trousers and hair on my head because the monks are clean shaven. And, uh, and he said, uh, he looked at me and he said, look, you know, if I don't tell you that I was sad and I'll be lying as a senior monk to lose another young monk, especially of your stature is a sad thing. But he said, I've known you for a long time and I know you took this decision very seriously and I trust you. <laughs> and, that, and then he immediately brought in a humor. He said, uh, he called his secretary and he said, look at Jimpa, you know, he always has a big head on a short body, and now with hair, his head looks even bigger. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, the, it's this beautiful combination of compassionate response, but also bringing humor to lighten up the situation. And that really sums up who he is as a, as a person. ¿Cómo se ha ido transformando el budismo desde sus tiempos en los campos de refugiado, cuando su madre batía el té con mantequilla entre plegarias? hasta su expansión por todo el mundo, ¿no? ¿Qué ha ganado y qué ha perdido en su contacto con Occidente? Like all major religions, um, you know, Christianity, Judaism, Islam, uh, you know, Hinduism, and so on, um, Buddhism also cannot escape the encounter with modernity. Um, in the case of Buddhism, because the Buddhist countries in general, and particularly Tibet, was very isolated from modernity, um, it was the rude awakening in the form of Tibetans losing their homeland, which brought Tibetan Buddhism in uh, encounter with modernity. So, and when two cultures interact, uh, um, there's always going to be give and take. That's the, that's the nature of history. 
Um, and cultural encounters in the long run uh, is mutually beneficial. Um, of course, in the process, you're going to lose some aspects. And, and His Holiness has, I mean, Tibetans are very lucky to have someone like him as the leader. And he has always emphasized not to get attached to all the aspects of the tradition. And he has reminded us that within the tradition, there are certain aspects which are more like customs, which are more like society norms, which are more relevant to a given time and a social structure. As time and social structure changes, those aspects of the customs may need to be modified. For example, like the gender equality is a major important. Um, in the traditional societies, you know, generally it's male dominated, particularly in the religious domain. As Tibetan Buddhism encounters modernity, modern secular values like gender equality, respect for the individual, um, less emphasis on hierarchy, um, you know, individual freedom and choice, um, those kind of things are really going to be important. And these have shaped uh, Tibetan Buddhism. Um, for example, like uh, uh, Tibetan Buddhism now, for the entire history, for the first time, there is the Geshe Ma, which is the highest academic degree that a monk can earn. And until recently, no woman can earn it. And His Holiness has made the changes. So now we have Geshe's who are women mm -hmm. and receiving these degrees from the nunneries. So that's a major change. And similarly, um, you know, their attitude towards, you know, women is changing. Um, and also, um, you know, more and more women spiritual teachers are emerging within the community. So I think the Buddhist tradition will gain a lot from encounter with modernity. <coughs> and also, for example, in the case of uh, philosophy, um, historically, Buddhism has not engaged with science. So now, with the modernity, Buddhism's engagement with science help the philosophy to be informed by scientific understanding and scientific knowledge. So all of this is really good, because um, now on the contemporary culture and society side, um, the encounter with Buddhism has also been a very constructive one. Um, Buddhism emphasizes the importance of uh, quality of life, not so much materialism. Uh, and it challenges the orthodox idea that uh, through acquisition you can be happy. So Buddhism challenges that. Uh, and also Buddhism, one of the central message of Buddhism is that um, uh, you can train your mind. You can train your mind and to a large extent the sources of suffering are inside. So therefore the solution to those sufferings can also be found inside. So through training your mind, learning to pay attention, learning to expand your uh, empathy and compassion, you can live a more conscious and happy life. So we're beginning to see these kind of impacts and the knowledge becomes more and more widespread. And including important professions like healthcare and education are now adapting important insights and techniques from the Buddhism. So I think on the whole, <coughs> the relationship and encounter has been a positive one. But there is also going to be some losses uh, and, you know, for example, like within the tradition, some, you know, some of the monks are really uh, skeptical about um, secular adoption of Buddhist meditation. Mm -hmm. So there are criticism and there's some fear because they wo they're worried that this kind of secularization may undermine the traditional, you know, people's you know, uh, loyalty and attachment to their, to, their, to their tradition. So there's always going to be some aspects going to get lost here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. gracias. Bueno, usted fue monje desde los 11 años y luego dejó los hábitos y fundó una familia. ¿Qué encontró al otro lado de la vida monástica que pueda favorecer la práctica? ¿no? ¿Cuáles son las fortalezas de una posición monástica, de una posición de estar en el mundo? Y me preguntaría también, ¿hay que renunciar a samsara, a la familia, porque implica, porque implica apego, como decía el Buda? That's a very, very um, um, interesting question. Um, and, um, you know, every now and then I get asked this because I've lived two lives. Um, um, I mean, of course, 
there are a lot of advantages for leading a monastic life. Um, so, you know, some of which are, for example, um, I really value the mental discipline that monastic life taught me um, to be able to really, you know, quieten your mind, to be able to apply your mind, to really um, uh, maintain focus. Um, so those kind of uh, things are really trainings that I really value from the monastery. And also uh, one of the things from the monastery that I really value is the quality of relationship that is close, but that is not intimate in a romantic sense. So that is um, something that you learn from your monastery. And I suppose people who go into military might have similar experience. There's a kind of a camaraderie. Um, Another thing is that um, in the monastery, uh, we learn to be emotionally independent. Mm -hmm. So we learn to find our own strength and anchor, emotional anchor within ourselves. Um, and then of course, as a larger background, you have the monastic community, but individuals are expected to find their own core and live from there. So those are really <coughs> uh, powerful skills I've learned. But on the other hand, I mean, as a family man, um, there are certain important practices that I find actually more effective by living as a family man. For example, like, um, you know, the loving kindness meditation, compassion training that we talk about in Buddhism. One of the core elements of compassion is relationship. Mm -hmm. And also the, 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 the challenges that comes from close relationship is the ability to not to forget the humanity of the other person. Especially when you are challenged and stressed, when you're being attacked, you know, like, in a, you know, like with your spouse. Um, and the, the interesting thing about family life is that with your spouse, a good healthy relationship is a relationship where you don't have to pretend. You're yourself. You can be completely naked. So in some sense, you are vulnerable in front of another person. Those kind of experiences rarely happen in a monastic context because you never fully allow that level of intimacy because you don't have, you know, intimate relationship. So I find that part of, you know, family life uh, very rich. Uh, it also is a fantastic opportunity for spiritual practice because that really, you know, uh, allows you to explore quite deeply into your vulnerability without being defensive you know, being present. And similarly, you know, as a parent, um, when, especially when the children are small, uh, I found experientially what the Buddhist texts were talking about, the, the unconditional nature of love. Mm -hmm. You know, if you are a monk, you can imagine, you know, you can meditate, but you don't feel it here. But if you're a lay person, if you're, you know, a parent, and there is a young child who whose need is real and immediate in front of you, you have to drop everything and be there for that young child. And th there, there is a quality of unconditionality and also a tremendous depth of patience that you rarely get it, you know, in other areas of life. So those are, uh, I find, teaching of patience, teaching of loving kindness, teaching of relationship, you know, those kind of things, um, I find that the family life offers a lot more opportunities. And also, in, uh, as a family man, you also have a lot more stresses. You know, if you're living a monastic life, you have much less st stress because the life is structured and it's more predictable. And, uh, you know, your colleagues don't impose too much of their emotional kind of, you know, problem on you. So there's a kind of a protection. But if you're a lay person, you're living as a family man, you know, as a parent, you have to make a living, you have to pay the bills, you know, I mean, all of this daily life, there are many more stressors. And, you know, in some sense, if you're truly serious about your spiritual growth, you know, family, being a family person really gives you a lot more opportunities um, to really kind of, you know, apply your spiritual practice and grow from these you know, more challenging experiences. So I'm, you know, I feel fortunate that I've had both. <laughs> yes, I think so. <laughs> Vamos a ir acercándonos hacia el sufrimiento con la pregunta 5. ¿Por qué si la budeidad es nuestra auténtica naturaleza, 
se oscurece de tal modo en cuanto nos manifestamos en este plano de existencia, ¿por qué al encarnarnos nos enajenamos de nuestra propia perfección? That's a, that, that's a very serious question. Um, the concept of Buddha nature is very important in Buddhism, um, especially in Mahayana and Tibetan tradition. Uh, and the idea is that there is the, the essential nature of our mind is pure. Um, that there is the potential and seed for full enlightenment in all of us, not just humans, but in all sentient beings. And it is that essential purity of the essential nature that allows us the possibility to become fully enlightened and perfected. So that is a very important part of the uh, philosophy of Buddhism. Um, then the question is, you know, why is it clouded? by afflictions, emotions, you know, negative tendencies, negative behavior. Um, so here it gets more complicated. Um, uh, in, in Buddhism there is this understanding that um, uh, many of the, I mean, you know, there is a recognition that human beings are very complex creatures. Um, just as you have positive, you know, impulses like kindness, love and compassion, you also have negative tendencies and impulses like aggression, um, jealousy and attachment and greed and anger and so forth. So it is these, you know, the negative tendencies and, uh, you know, particularly the more emotional ones that obscure our nature. And because, and, and here probably the, uh, some perspective from the evolutionary science would be helpful because you know, um, evolutionary science understands the evolution of human being over a process of long, um, you, know, uh, se you know, selection process. And we as social creatures are equipped with certain emotions so that we can deal with, you know, fear is a good protection against danger, so then you can run or you can fight if you can deal with it. So uh, I think so Buddhism and science would both agree that these negative tendencies, these destructive tendencies uh, are really part of our nature as well. So um, I think it's the Buddha nature concept should not be understood as some kind of original purity that somehow gotten messed up in a long history. That I don't think is not a good idea too, not a good way to understand it. Mm -hmm. But it's better, it's more helpful to understand it as a potential that exists in all of us. And so that the idea is that because if the essential nature of mind is pure, then there is the possibility that you can eliminate all the negative things that are obscuring that purity. So it's more of a future possibility and potential rather than the idea that at the beginning we were pure and then somehow in the process of evolution, it got, you know, clouded. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a quite a complicated question, yeah. yeah. Vamos a hablar del sufrimiento ya. Dice, una de las causas del sufrimiento es la impermanencia de los fenómenos. ¿Se puede asumir la impermanencia y al mismo tiempo celebrar la belleza efímera de los fenómenos con desapego? Yeah, that, uh, the question of imp impermanence is, is, um, um, is an important one, especially in Buddhism. Um, it's not so much that the impermanence itself is the cause of suffering, mm -hmm. but it's our attitude towards impermanence. So, and, and a large part of that suffering comes from our inability to accept it. Mm -hmm. So it's not just intellectually, but it's more from an experiential and viscerally. So, um, and we tend to, for example, like in, in Buddhist psychology, this understanding is that we, you know, we tend to assume permanence to things that are imp impermanent. We tend to assume that there is something called real me inside me, which is a sort of an eternal self. And a large part of what we do is motivated by wanting to protect it, wanting to nurture it. So there's a kind of a strong grasping goes on. And, and because we deep down assume there to be a something like that, a large part of our relationship with others, our relationship with the world is motivated by, you know, seeing threat to this real me or something that is good for this real me. So you have either attachment or anger or aversion. 
And in this process is also our inability to accept impermanence. We tend to assume things would last. And that probably has a much deeper uh, psychological reason because, you know, we, you know, the fact that we are earthly beings walking on this earth, we assume when we walk, the earth is going to be there. That when, it, that we, can, when we take the next step, the earth is going to be there, stable for our feet to land. Um, so that kind of expectation for some kind of groundedness and security is a very important part of who we are as human beings and sentient beings. Um, now, what happens is that we then, based on this, we project permanence. And we are then able to make ourselves unable to accept changes and impermanence. So what the what Buddhist tradition is suggesting is that actually you can liberate yourself if you make the radical change and instead of assuming permanence, if you embrace impermanence, then impermanence on one way you can look at it as a negative way where things don't last. So that's a negative way of looking at it. But another way of looking at impermanence is that every moment is fresh. So that's a, you know, a, a positive way of looking at impermanence, which then opens up the possibility. Because if nothing is permanent, then everything is changeable. And there's always the possibility. So this is a sort of more constructive way of looking at reality. And then once you embrace impermanence in this way, then you, you become more open to future. Because for example, when we, when we talk about impermanence, we're also talking about the future. You know, you can respond to future by, because future is uncertain, uncertain, future is open. You can respond to it with curiosity, or you can respond to it with, with anxiety. That is up to us. And which one you choose is going to make all the difference. If you're going to choose anxiety, you know, to respond to uncertainty, that's going to completely color your life. If you're, if you're going to choose curiosity about an openness about future, that's going to completely change your life. So, that, so that's a very difficult message, but it's a very profound one. Because the fact is that nothing lasts. That is a fact. Now how you take that reality is the question. Yes. In Occidente, hay una tendencia a convertir en objeto de deseo hasta la iluminación. Pero el fin último del budismo no es la iluminación, por lo que tengo entendido, sino el regreso a la plaza del mercado, como dicen en el Zen. ¿Nos puede hablar de esa metáfora para ilustrar por qué hay que poner más corazón en las manos, en la acción? That, that is true, but I don't know whether that is actually a very specific Western thing, the sort of objectification of things. Um, generally, the human mind, you know, when it finds something useful or valuable, uh, it takes it more seriously. And there was something that you take more seriously, the more, become, more attached you become. Um, the only difference is in the West, primarily because of the secular kind of materialistic culture, and commodification, because um, it's a very important part of, uh, you know, dominant part of the secular kind of life. Maybe the objectification of Buddhist practices and you know, goals like enlightenment becomes more evident and more pronounced. So maybe that's, that's the case. Um, now, that one of the challenges Buddhism throws at us, um, or throws at the modern person, is how to pursue your life with spirituality where you are inspired of, you know, by a particular vision to live a compassionate love, a life, um, to become more enlightened. So you need to be inspired. So without some vision, you're not going to be inspired. So you need a powerful vision to inspire you and to motivate you. But at the same time, not become attached to the goal. That is a difficult one. That is a very fine balance uh, because generally when we feel inspired and by a vision we become attached to a goal, we come up with a preconceived idea of what the goal looks like, so we are obsessed with the result and a lot of our efforts is contingent upon whether, whether or not we can achieve the result. 
So what Buddhism is saying is that you can find the middle way where you can be deeply inspired by a vision but not be attached to a goal because the problem with attachment to a goal is that attachment requires an object and if you're already attached you have a preconceived idea of what that end should look like um, so that is a big challenge and that's why in Zen Buddhism as well as in Tibetan tradition the Mayana tradition the emphasis is placed on um, being in the world you know being with the world so um, you know, there is a beautiful uh, saying that you're familiar in Zen, where it says, at the beginning there are mountains and rivers and so on. Then in the middle, uh, you know, there are, there is, you know, there's emptiness. And then in the finally there are still mountains and rivers. And the idea here is that uh, what the spiritual practice and meditation does is actually in some sense um, uh, give you a new way of seeing things. So initially we have our naive view of the world, seeing things as prominent, seeing things as independent, and seeing things as being out there, you know, if we objectify. And then as you go through the spiritual practice, you know, combining uh, meditation on emptiness, no self and compassion and interdependence, then at a certain point when you re-engage with the world, you see the same thing, but now you see it in a different way. And that I think is a much more powerful um, you know, spiritual vision because it sort of doesn't deny the world, doesn't retreat, you know, does not use detachment as a way of dealing with the world, but actually engagement with the world. And that approach I think is particularly suited to the contemporary uh, secular culture where a large part of our problem and distress really comes from a certain way of engaging with the world. So I think, so, but you know, one thing that is for sure is that Buddhism, when you take it seriously, it's challenging. It really challenges you. Vamos a hablar ahora de sati, de mindfulness. Nos puede dar su definición de mindfulness, ya que como dice Alan Wallace, eh, la traducción que tengamos de smriti o sati nos llevará a un lugar o a otro de nuestra práctica. ¿Cuál sería la diferencia esencial respecto a la definición del mindfulness occidental? So the question about how um, you know the modern um, movement of mindfulness understands what mindfulness is versus how sati and mindfulness is understood in the Buddhist tradition is is a complicated one. Um, um, and f first of all, I think we need to make a distinction between mindfulness as a, f as a practice mm -hmm. and mindfulness as a quality of mind or a, f or, or a faculty. Um, so that I think is an important distinction to be made. Um, when we talk about the modern context, uh, we're really talking about mindfulness as a practice, mm -hmm. a particular way of cultivating the practice. In the traditional um, Buddhist kind of uh, context, um, a differentiation is made between mindfulness as a faculty. And there, mindfulness refers to that aspect of our mind which allows us to maintain our attention on a chosen object. So there's a, you know, mindfulness is premised upon ability to pay attention and also maintain it. So there is a kind of a, and that's why uh, sometimes uh, modern scholars translate mindfulness as retention. Mm -hmm. So it's the retention of your attention on a chosen object in a disciplined way. So that's the faculty. Uh, and then when you do the practice, then we're talking about satipatthana, which is the application of mindfulness. Mm -hmm. And then um, basically what is happening is that you are choosing to observe a certain phenomena like a body, so mindfulness on body. So you, you, you observe the body and you can either do it by kind of, you know, scanning it from head to toe, so that using body as an object of your meditation and just simply observing what goes on. In a more advanced form, then you also 
probe the nature of body. So you're bringing up impermanence, you're bringing up the body is composed of so many different things, you know, all of this. So you're kind of now delving deeper into the nature of body itself. So those, so therefore in classical Buddhist mindfulness meditation, it's not simply paying attention, but it's also probing. So there is a wisdom component. In contemporary context, you know, now these days mindfulness is quite widespread. Um, what has happened is, you know, a distinction is not that much drawn between mindfulness as a quality and faculty versus mindfulness as a practice. So a lot of the work and research findings are really based on the practice. And the, in the, as I understand, the modern mindfulness has emphasized the paying attention in a very disciplined way and remaining in the present as the key, you know, sort of component. And another key component that mindfulness, modern mindfulness brings is the meta-awareness practice, which is observing what goes in the theater of your mind without rushing to judgment, you know, being in the present and simply allowing thoughts and emotions to arise. Uh, and and so it's, it is a very powerful practice because it allows you to pay attention. It allows you to be in the present, not rush to judgment. Uh, and it also it allows you this ability to apply your mind by observing. So modern mindfulness, I would see it as emphasizing those practices. And they are actually rooted in the traditional practice, but in modern mindfulness, that aspect has been emphasized. And uh, so, for example, in the traditional mindfulness practice, we talk of four applications on body, feelings, mind, and contents of the mind. In modern mindfulness, these distinctions really don't matter that much. It's basically body, and then, you know, feelings is part of the body, and then you have, you know, thoughts and their, you know, contents, particularly the thoughts. Um, so, so it's the, the approach is a little different, but the modern mindfulness is clearly based on the, the traditional practice. Vamos a hacer una crítica solo al mindfulness para ver su punto de vista. Se habla de que la, des, la descontextualización del elemento mindfulness, ¿no? sacarlo del, del ecosistema, del sendero octuple, eh, se puede tener una atención plena si no hay una intención correcta o una sabiduría correcta. Eh, de alguna manera no podemos caer en instrumentalizar esa facultad o esa práctica para el bienestar hedonista en vez de para el despertar. Yeah, well, thank you for asking that question because um, um, you know there's now a growing criticism of the modern mindfulness movement, and I'm not surprised because when um, new movements take place, uh, and particularly the movements that are that explicitly acknowledge inspired by you know aspects from other tradition uh, there is going to be cultural critique um, so the the criticism um, some of them are legitimate um, and understandable and i'm not surprised that th this criticism is happening and i see this as a very positive phenomenon because it will force people who are champions of mindfulness in a modern context to be more self-critical of what they are doing but if you look at the criticism, some of the criticisms are not particularly legitimate. For example, um, um, this whole debate about decontextualization from the Buddhist context and using it in a modern secular context. I personally don't see anything wrong with it. In fact, I see this as a positive you know, um, phenomenon because when it's being brought into the secular world, people who are bringing it are not trying to bring Buddhism to the West. You know, people are bringing it as a particular technique, a skill that people can learn to make their life more bearable, deal with stress, and find more peace in their life. There's nothing wrong with, you know, if there is a technique that is found in the East among meditation that can be applied in that way. Of course, when you do that, you need to be honest and truthful to say that you are doing this, you know, and don't pretend that you are bringing Buddhism 
or somehow say this is the essence of the Buddhist teaching. So I think so long as the work is done consciously and self-critically, I don't think there is anything wrong. And, and in fact, the Buddha himself said that he has taught only one thing and one thing only, that is suffering and how to elevate it. So elevation of suffering, removal of suffering, was the most important motivation behind Buddha's own teachings. So if aspects of his teachings can be applied in a way that benefits people to deal with their suffering, there's nothing wrong. Now the problem, you know, that there is some uh, debate or, or criticism which I think is legitimate, which is commodification of this, and particularly bringing it into the corporate sector, where it is being promoted as a way to make individuals be more efficient, uh, more attentive, more engaged. Um, and generally, we need to watch out because in modern context, particularly in the corporate world, when we use the word efficient, we actually mean speed, getting more things done. And that is partly an uh, effect of computers. You know, the computers, the more efficient computers are faster. Yes. And this has completely changed the culture. And now in the corporate world, when people say efficient, they mean faster. So if you're going to, if you want your, if you're bringing mindfulness into your corporate sector, to deal with the stress and make the employees more efficient, then you are promoting your business interest. You know, you're doing it so that people don't complain too much. Mm -hmm. in. So it's a lot more like a kind of a putting a band-aid uh, and sort of finding a way to, and, and some, some of these critics have said, this is like kind of the opiates of the masses, mm -hmm. you know, giving opiates to sort of calm down their disgruntled kind of, you know, uh, uh, you know reaction. I think there, I think there is some legitimacy to the criticism and I think it is important. Um, so therefore, most, many of the good mindfulness teachers will never isolate mindfulness teaching from loving kindness or ethics. I think that needs to be brought in. Because I, and 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 part of that I think is I mean the you know some degree of instrumentalization I don't think can be avoided because you know instrumentalization is a, we are talking about turning it into technique mm -hmm. and without techniques you can't teach it so there is some degree of ins instrumentalization that is unavoidable and in some sense it's actually quite good but instrumentalization that is extreme then turns everything into functional things without giving people the possibility of the big picture. For example, like through mindfulness, if it is done in the right way, if it is, you know, um, associated with ethics and values and loving kindness, this will open door to greater spiritual kind of, you know, quest. And it, it helps individuals become more fully human. So I think if it is done in the right way, um, I think uh, this is an important movement. And then the cultural critique, I mean, one important concern behind the critique, especially coming from the traditional Buddhist monks, I think that needs to be taken seriously, which is that the senior monks worry because of the popularization of mindfulness practice, secular versions of mindfulness practice because it's all available in English. Most educated young people in Asia speak English, read English. They start reading and getting to know these practices from the secular version. And then once they take this, then they start criticizing the traditional practice and they lose touch with the traditional kind of, you know, uh, Dharma. And that I think is an important consideration. So I think it's important that um, those who are at the forefront of promoting mindfulness in a secular way uh, remain cognizant and, and sensitive to those. So, but on the whole, I, I think that this, this critical voice that is emerging is a good thing. Muy bien, pues vamos a hablar ahora de de Shila, de la virtud. Nos vamos a ir directamente a la compasión, al a la 30. Vamos allá. Vamos a hablar de compasión y porque los budistas también custodian la mente eh, por un ideal altruista. ¿no? Y entonces vamos a hablar de compasión como ese elemento que impediría esa instrumentalización, ¿no? el cuerpo de virtud, sila, ¿no? el frescor que dice. 
So thank you for asking about compassion. I, I think it's, um, of course, it is a very important um, uh, part of the teaching in Buddhism traditionally. Um, but I would say that it's also important teaching in all the old religious traditions. Um, Buddhism may have more um, techniques because of the emphasis on meditation, but as a teaching itself, uh, it's universal. Um, and uh, because of the universality of compassion, uh, I think there is a much uh, greater chance that teaching of compassion can be more spread widely. So the, now, what, what do we mean by compassion? How do we define it? Um, I define compassion as the natural sense of concern that arises in us when we are confronted with someone who needs something, who is in need or who is suffering and we want to see the situation change or want to do something about it. That is a very natural human sentiment. And in, when compassion arises, then it's a complex process. It arises spontaneously, but it is a complex process. And especially there are, most importantly, three things are happening pretty much at the same time. One is you see the situation and you understand the situation. You feel emotionally moved by the situation. So you make an emotional connection to this person who is in need. And then you want to see the situation change. So you want to do something about it. So there is a motivation and action component. So you have a perception and understanding, you have emotional empathy connection, and then you have the motivational response to do something about it. So I think um, it's a very natural human response. But then the question is, why do we need to train it? Now, we need to train it not because we have to learn it new, but we have to train it to make it more conscious in our everyday life. And also, uh, because normally we leave compassion at the level of reaction, at the level of reason, uh, 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 response. So when there is a, someone suffering and crying, it elicits compassion in us. So we leave it at that. But if we can make compassion a basic standpoint, a perspective from which we relate to the world, then, you know, in some sense, we have a, a new way of being in the world. Now, in order for compassion to be turned into a standpoint, you need to cultivate it, you need to train it. Another reason why we need to train compassion is um, because normally, except in extreme situations, we keep it only for a small circle of people our loved ones. Outside that, we don't expect compassion, but also we don't give compassion. But in order to be able to move beyond the small circle, again, you need training. And the third reason why we need training is that, although compassion is natural, we also bring a lot of resistances. You know, some of them may be rooted in culture, thinking that, you know, especially for men. So, you know, if I'm compassionate, people will see this as a weakness and take advantage of me. And then women tend to worry that, you know, mothers tend to say, if I'm too kind to my kid, the kind, then my child may become overly dependent on me, you know. And then sometimes more empathetic people feel that, you know, being compassionate means I have to solve everybody's problem. So we, we bring these resistances and then even in the context of intimate relationships, sometimes we block our compassionate response and we bring defensiveness, we bring judgment, you know. So, uh, so therefore, in order to find a way to deal with this, you need training. So that's why compassion training is really helpful, so that you can make that part of who you are much more explicit, much more evident, and much more forceful. Antes de trabajar la, la compasión, no habría que trabajar la bondad amorosa Empezar por un fondo de felicidad suficiente para afrontar el inmenso sufrimiento del mundo que nos rodea. Uh, that's a very good question, actually. Um, I think you know, actually, loving kindness and compassion are two sides of the same coin. Mm -hmm. um, loving kindness focuses more on happiness and wishing others well, so it's more from a positive angle. Compassion focuses on others from the point of view of suffering and need. So it's more from the... But between the two, you are right. In order to promote optimism, in order to promote an approach where you don't give up, um, in order to feel more encouraged 
I think promotion of loving kindness is really good. <clears throat> but on the other hand, compassion is a much more powerful motivating factor because compassion focuses on a need. And when you see someone in need and suffering, you're, there's a much greater tendency on your part wanting to do something. So if you want to see a real change in the world, I think you need both loving kindness, but more importantly, you need compassion. And, and the interesting thing about compassion is that although it explicitly focuses on other suffering, but when you actually allow your heart to, because in order to arise compassion, you need to care. Mm -hmm. You know, if you don't care, compassion doesn't come. So you need to, first of all, understand. Secondly, you need to care about it. And then thirdly, the wish comes to see the situation change. So although in compassion there is a focus on the suffering and the problem, but because you want to do something about it, you want to see the situation change, it turns out in the brain, the reward centers of the brain also keep lights up. And that is interesting because that probably is evolutionarily adapted because if you don't feel elevated, because when you are able to truly do something to others out of pure kindness, you feel bigger, you feel elevated. And, you know, so, and, and in some sense, you feel that you have served a purpose. You find, you feel, find meaning in this. And maybe it is these factors that really boost your brain so that you remember next time. So I think compassion, although has this kind of, you know, focus on suffering, so there is a little element of distress because you are taking on someone's suffering. But once you actually do it, you know, there is this uplifting part of it too. ¿Cree usted que el mundo moderno ha olvidado su dimensión espiritual por una dinámica de ciclos cósmicos que van de la luz a un oscurecimiento de la ley del Dharma inscrita en el corazón de cada hombre, como sostienen algunas tradiciones, incluida la budista? ¿Hay que esperar la venida de un nuevo Buda para que vuelva a girar la rueda de, de la ley? ¿Cuál es su, su mirada sobre la situación en la que estamos en este momento? That's a very interesting uh, question. Um, I, I personally believe that um, regardless of what individuals may say, each one of us is a deeply spiritual person. Um, traditionally, we choose to express that spirituality through an organized religion. Um, and in the Asian context, it still is the case. The majority of the people are you know, believers in a particular faith tradition. In the West, because of the long history of enlightenment and secularization and uh, the restructuring of the relationship between church and state and all of this, um, people have you know, sort of identified less and less with the you know, traditional way of expressing spirituality. But even though that is the case, I don't think people have actually stopped being spiritual, you know, because at the heart of every individual, there is a quest for meaning. And that is, in a sense, the essence of spirituality. You know, we humans are probably the only species on earth that is whose whose motivation is not just driven by survival and you know, sort of physical flourishing. We want to find meaning. And for some people, that quest may be more pronounced, more articulated, but for a lot of people, it may not be articulated well, but there is still this quest for meaning. You know? And the fact that human beings have ability to imagine, for example, like each one of us, is going to die. And death is a very important reality of human life. And, you know, if someone is like me, I'm turned 60, in my life, I have now seen several deaths of my intimate family members. And this awareness of death is probably one of the most important impulses for this quest for meaning. You know, if at the end of my life, I'm going to disappear, why I'm here? And that, in a sense, is the fundamental spiritual question. So um, I don't think spirituality has gone away. Um, it probably has become more diffused. And in the West, we have left it to the individuals to sort it out. 
Now, um, the, my own feeling is that as our world becomes more complicated, it is becoming complicated, as the world becomes more integrated and globalized, um, and with now the media and everything, so people are confronted with a reality of plurality of people and plurality of worldviews. And in this situation, and especially with the looming environmental crisis, I think we humans are now being pushed to come up with a different way of being in the world. Um, and also, I think, um, and, and I see movements like mindfulness and movements like compassion training as a way of society's awakening. You know, it may start in, initially from selected individuals who self-select, you know, they, they find meaning in these things. But in a sense, they are the initial pioneers who are building up the critical mass. And as important sectors embrace compassion and mindfulness in their, you know, everyday structuring, um, I think there is a dawning of a new spirituality. You know, I mean, spirituality is probably not the right word, but, yeah, and, and one of the things that the encounter with Buddhism and modern secular culture and science particularly has been, you know, making people become aware that a large part of the power to deal with problems is in us. You know, empowering individuals so that they can turn their mind into allies in dealing with their difficulties in their everyday life and making their life more meaningful and joyful. And that, I think, is a really a new thing in the world. I mean, in the past, you had religions, you have gurus and priests who represent and they give you extra instructions. Or you have, you know, psychologists and therapists who are the experts and who treat you. But now we're in a time where each and every person can become their own therapist. Each and every person can become their own spiritual counselor. So there is this tremendous democratization of these techniques and mental skills. And I think this will change the world. I think this will really change the world because in the end, everybody wants to live a happy life, a life that is less stressful, a life that also has a meaning. So I think what is happening now is really, I would say it's a kind of a new kind of spiritual awakening is happening. Thank you. Thank you.